sometimes you know pe people can get um into a position where you know there's, there's a mortgage to pay there are school fees to pay and although you might want to think you're a leader who's going to really help to change the culture of an organization you might find it's beyond your means to do that so we make compromises as people don't we we can be aware that situations are difficult but at the same time it's beholden on us as leaders to try and be at our best and help others be at our best have you ever wondered how understanding your nervous system better could be the key to managing stress and becoming a more effective leader welcome to another episode of leading with integrity i am david hatch i'm your guide on this journey of leadership exploration this month on the podcast, we are talking about the intersection of technology and leadership, the opportunities and challenges faced by tech leaders and managers in the technology sphere. We'll be going back and forth, really, between some of the people aspects of leadership that are very relevant to tech industry companies and leaders. The AI won't do it for you. Leading in tech. And today we're delving into a topic that's relevant to every leader and manager out there, really, but especially so for those leaders in high-tech, fast-paced, and often high-stress working environments. Our guest today is Chris Wood, the brilliant mind behind the pinball wizardry approach, which we'll be hearing more about very soon. Chris has spent years decoding the fascinating world of polyvagal theory and its application to stress management and beyond. With his expertise, by the end of this episode, we'll hopefully share a deeper understanding of the nervous system and how it can empower us as leaders. And together, we will be discovering those secrets to managing stress, harnessing the power of polyvagal theory, and exploring the practical applications that could help elevate your leadership. Managing stress and mental health is not something the AI can help us with, so it feels like another pretty good fit for our discussions this month. This is Leading with Integrity, Leadership Talk, the podcast for first-time managers who are working in tech-driven businesses and teams and who want to be more effective, people-first leaders. Each week, you will learn the crucial strategies, mindsets, and practical tips that successful modern leaders follow to be engaging, ethical and authentic managers who get the best from their teams. And we'll achieve all of this via weekly conversations with leaders, with leadership experts, entrepreneurs and business owners, people who have already walked this path and have some amazing insights to share with an added sprinkling of occasional solo episodes and some group chats where we'll have multiple guests. My name is David Hatch and I will be your host. And leadership has always been a passion for me. After a career spent in a series of small businesses during 15 years in the aerospace industry, five or six of those at the end of that career were in a space startup in the UK. So trying to launch satellites into orbit, very cool stuff. And through all of that experience, I learned that the secret to successful management is in the ability to apply great leadership. And in turn, the secret to great leadership, it's all about your integrity, putting people before profits. the Leading with Integrity podcast. Leadership talk for the modern manager. With your host, David Hatch. I'm joined today by my guest, Chris. Chris, thank you so much for being here today. I'm really looking forward to having a conversation with you. David, it's great to be here this afternoon. Yeah, really looking forward to spending some time with you. Yeah, absolutely. And so on that note, we're going to start by me giving you the reins really to introduce yourself to the listeners tell us a bit about your background what you get up to today how you've ended up doing that really and and why you do it why it's your passion sure well, th thank you for the uh, the opportunity to to do so very happy to take up the reins i promise to give them back at some point <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, my name is chris wood i'm a leadership coach 
Um, I work with individuals, with teams and with groups um, in um, organisations, in corporations, uh, a lot of uh, tech work, a lot of uh, comms and marketing work as well, and professional services as a whole. Um, I try to demystify coaching. Um, there's quite a lot of jargon around it, so I try to speak in plain terms that, that my mates uh, in the pub or on the terraces might understand. And my main goal is to help leaders be able to really um, live with ease in their role. It can be so um, easy to fall into the trap of thinking this is a burden, whereas leadership is actually a privilege and you can work to enjoying it more. And when a leader enjoys themselves more, so do the people around them. And guess what? Results tend to follow as well. Um, I came to do this job. Um, I've been doing it now for 10 years um, and it's my second career. My first career was in public relations, um, which I was in man and boy, uh, 25 years, 18 of those years at board level. And the beautiful thing about PR is that increasingly in this day and age, businesses are looking at PR from a very senior level. So as a humble PR account executive with about a year's experience, you get to talk to chief executives and finance directors. So from a very early stage in my working life, I was talking to very senior people about the challenges at the heart of their business. And I was very content marrying those two things for all those years in PR. But then there came a point that I was way more interested in the development of the people around me than I was in actually the core product of the businesses that I was running. And that felt like a good cue to retrain. So I went to Henley Business School, subsequently did an MSc um, in applied psychology and coaching, science and applied science. Yeah, I really have a passion for helping people develop in a way that is kind of plain speaking, um, but is rooted in science that is evidence based so that people have a degree of uh, comfort and a degree of kind of believability in that they're following a path that others have followed to some success. So actually quite an unusual journey to arrive at leadership coaching, I think. But then again, when you think about it, actually you know i mean the pr and the, and the communications world is it is about that isn't it it's communication and yeah. so much of leadership is the same isn't yeah it? and so, some of my work now is purely around helping leaders to communicate whether it's in a one-to-one -one meeting or talking at a conference but you're absolutely right there was a, a, a crossover of skills because it, it, in a way i've spent my entire working life helping people figure out what they want to say and how best to say it the big difference between the two is that as a coach, you don't have an opinion or a preferred outcome. That's to, for you to help the client get to. As a PR man, obviously you do. You'll say, this is the way we're going to do it. And that took me some learning. That was probably the barrier I came up against through my coach training. But yeah, there is a, a crossover of skills for sure between the two disciplines yeah yeah and i guess another difference would be the the direction of communication external versus internal facing yeah, that sort of exactly. thing yeah and as a coach one of the beauties of coaching is you get to go really deep internally if you mm. go inside the individual in fact there was a bit, a bit of a turning point about when i thought actually i do need to get into coaching it's going to be fascinating was when uh, as a as a seat by that stage a senior pr person and you get to the point of being so senior you're not really talking about the business you're bonding with senior clients and, and understanding them to a, a quite an intimate level and then I remember having a debrief with a particular client and he said to me Chris the thing is that this particular organization every morning I have to check in my humanity and I thought two things I thought wow that's really interesting and I can see that having worked with people in the organization and also I don't really know how to answer that or how to handle that, but I'd love to know how to. And so that made me think, OK, learning some coaching skills to be able to hold that space so that people can say something like that and then explore it a little bit and not just feel that's going to be their reality until they retire or until they leave. Yeah, that's quite what a sad position to find yourself in. Isn't really it? Sad position. In no, yeah. He was he was a really senior guy. Still mm -hmm. is a really, really senior guy, albeit in another organisation. Wow. But sometimes you know pe people can get um, into a position where you know there's, there's a mortgage to pay, there are school fees to pay, and although you might want to think you're a leader who's going to really help to change the culture of an organisation, you might find it's beyond your means. To do that so we make compromises as people don't we we can be aware that situations are difficult 
but at the same time it's beholden on us as leaders to try and be at our best and help others be at our best absolutely yeah and not got much experience of it in that kind of large organization but i think there's there's certainly parallels with a lot of the people i work with who tend to be in the small businesses and the solopreneur mm-hmm. kind of kind of person between again it's that it's the compromise isn't it between knowing what your values are and why you're there and what your business is there to, to achieve but then at the same time you've got to keep the wolf from the door and if a bit of business is on offer and it's not quite the business that you would ideally want but you don't feel like you have a choice all the time yeah and you get, um, exactly, you've got bills to pay exactly um, you've got and i think the, the point about smes and solopreneurs is really interesting is because very very often there at your experience i i find that the I suppose I'm a solopreneur myself. But your identity can become wrapped up in the fortunes of your business. And that mm-hmm. in itself is, is a bit of a watch out sometimes. You might think, okay, do I go for the slightly fallow period by standing by my principles? Or do I go, okay, well, I'll do that. It's not the thing I really want to do, but it's going to pay some bills. It'll keep me going. So, yeah, we, we, we have such interesting questions to, uh, to ask ourselves, don't we, at whatever size organisation we're in. Yeah, indeed. And in in a lot of ways, I think it's quite encouraging, isn't it, that there's so many similarities almost wherever you go. There's always that kind of core part of the humanity and the human experience that's very, very similar. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Perhaps this is a a bit of a tangent, but I think it brings us into the next question quite nicely, because I know a lot of the work that you do is about helping people, particularly leaders, deal with stress and stressful Mm. situations. Mm. And obviously, stress and leadership are are sadly quite common bedfellows, aren't they? So what was it that originally drew you to that specific problem of of stress and leadership? I think um, it was both personal experience and what I see in my coaching and my own personal experience of being being a leader where i was you know running companies not not huge companies but you know big enough maybe 80 people that would upscale around summer events to 100 120 um i was aware of having sometimes high levels of stress sometimes potentially on the route to burnout but was very blessed with a supportive family who'd kind of pulled me back to to a better position but very often a kind of creeping anxiety and knowing that I wasn't being uh, the guy who was going to make the best decisions, perhaps wasn't the best guy to be around, certainly not when I got home at the weekend, and I'd spend the weekend recovering from what had happened in the week, and that's not a great way to spend your family life. And in my leadership practice now, which I mentioned, I've been been, been running this for, for 10 years, working with, with hun- hundreds of leaders, over thousands of, of practice hours, this low level creeping anxiety seems to be very prevalent amongst leaders, even more so perhaps in recent years with everything that's been go- going on in the world. Um, but it seems to be that leadership is in, for many people a, a burden. Yes, the salary is good and the prestige is good, but their lived experience of it um, isn't what they imagined when, you know, when when they started their working career. They thought this would be the time when, hey, this would be the thing I'd be enjoying, where I'd be really at my best. And too often, stress is stopping that happening. Yeah, I must say, there's a lot of a lot of bells ringing for me there as well. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it is. It's sadly, it's a story I hear too frequently, but also something I've been through myself as well. I mean, I definitely got to the point of burnout, and that's well, that's why I'm here doing this today. Actually, in a lot of ways, I yeah. think if I if I hadn't hit that wall, I'd probably still be in my last job. Yeah. Um, but I think, I yeah, I, I think what what I found particularly interesting about that experience, in hindsight, at the time it was ho- pretty horrible, and I had many of the same symptoms that you just mm. talked about there. And I think what what kind of was a wake up call for me in a lot of ways was when I realized that every conversation I was having with family and friends and people outside of work, all I was doing was complaining about work. <laughs> and I was sort of like, well, what's the point of this? If, if that's all I'm doing in my personal life, that's yeah. me. And, and it reminds me of the, the old phrase, you know, you don't, you don't live to work, you work to live. Yeah, abs- absolutely. I think that's, a, that's a, one of those aphorisms that really holds water, doesn't it? Mm. Um, well, I, I would say though, this, as we get into this discussion of, of stress, mm-hmm. I'm not, anti-stress per se we all need a level of stress to be able to perform our best what i'd like to think i'm helping people to do and the feedback from practice tells me that i'm helping people to do is to find a balance that they can go yeah i'm going to 
inject a bit of stress into this situation because the pitch is tomorrow and stuff needs to happen, for example. But also then they can switch off and they can ramp back to a more relaxed position. So to your point a moment ago, Dave, you're not having that every conversation is about work and I'm complaining, that you can let other things come into your mind uh, and you can share those. You're, you're sufficiently switched on to all of your wonderful communication skills that we all have, your social skills, to be able to share and engage with others. Yeah, I again, 100% agree with you there, I think. I mean, just be, yes, there is a certain level of stress. I think that's necessary, as you say, to, mm. to, to give us the motivation sometimes, yeah. even just to get get things done. But also, I think, and maybe this is as another thing you said, a sign of the times. I think some levels of stress is just unavoidable, isn't it? Yeah. Particularly if you're employed by someone else, and there's always going to be something there. I think, yes. and if if you don't feel like you have control of your own fate and all that sort of stuff. Although, of course, everyone is different. Every individual is affected by these things differently. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it's interesting perhaps to think about it in terms of am I, the stress that I'm experiencing, is it is it constructive for myself and for the people who are employing me or for my own business? Is it constructive for those around me? Or is it tipped over to destructive where I'm negatively impacting on the people around me, where I'm really eating into my own resources and reserves too much that I'm going to leave myself a bit of a, a sh- shallow hulk at the end of the day. You know, what, is, is it something that's, that's helpful or do I need to find another gear? And being able to find those gears is, is a really important element of a lot of the work that I do with leaders. Absolutely. And so much of it really is it's not about removing stress is it it's about how you manage it and i think there's another aspect of it as well about being able to identify and and remove i think the unnecessary type of stress because yes. there's always going to be that level as we've said but and i think this is where the the interplay with leadership becomes particularly mm. interesting and useful for me because as a leader can you look at your team and the people that you work with can you identify some of the the red flags for stress can you figure out what what is necessary what is required in order to get the job done or what's just a natural part of your business or your industry or, or whatever yeah and what of it is being perhaps created through some behavior maybe even of yours as the leader and yeah. i think that's that's a self-awareness piece there as well that i think a lot of leaders could could really stand to work more on yeah and I, <laughs> yeah i think you're right that's it. self-awareness is definitely something we, we could probably all do with some so even some more self-awareness for all of us I think absolutely yeah but very specifically about this as well yeah, I think. absolutely yeah. i think so i think what's really interesting there you made me think about you know that the role of the leader is to create an environment that gets the best out of people and the leader is the, the chief engineer of that environment and if something isn't working the leader's the person who's got license to change it and very often they have way more license than they realize particularly if they're, if they're in an organization and what the organization wants to see are these specific deliverables and for all that quite rightly lots of organizations are now talking much more about culture there's still room for micro cultures within the overall culture that will get the best out of a particular unit of people and leaders are the ones who can say what's going to work best for their team yes indeed well they're the ones with the ear to the ground i suppose aren't they they're dealing face to face with all those people which again is, is part of the reason why the work that I do is focused on those new managers. It's the first rung up the mm. ladder. It's the people who are leading for the first time because they're the ones, in my opinion anyway, who can have the most impact on the people doing the actual work. And I think there's so much of this stuff is focused on the the top leadership of the company. I think they're spoiled, to be honest. They get too much of this. I think it needs to be distributed more fairly. Yeah. So, well, um, yeah. Well, let's hope we can do some of that distribution work today. Well, I hope so. That <laughs> is that is one of the big aims of this podcast. So yeah. there we go. And so when we talk about managing the, the stress and, and mm. strategies to achieve that, you have your own approach for this, mm. which is called Pinball Wizardry. And I love that yeah. because big fan of The Who and they had a song called Pinball Wizard. Um, as may, many people may or may not know, might be showing my age. Mm. And it's based on something called polyvagal theory, which yeah. I confess I didn't know anything about. I've done a bit of Googling, but mm. it'd be really good if you can talk us through 
a your approach and b yeah. the, that theory and how they're connected because from what i understand on my limited research mm. it's it's a relatively new theory field of science mm. it's as yet unproven scientifically in a lot of ways although what is in science that's kind mm. of the nature of it so so yeah if you tell us a bit more about that and maybe explain what it is that gives you confidence in that theory and yeah. how your approach leverages it well shall i start with the the questions you've raised about the science and, yeah, and then i'll come back to my approach if that's sorry it was a very long-winded question <laughs> i do apologize but, all, yeah. that's all i was wondering <laughs> i go with my approach while leaving the science question hanging or should we should we talk about the science first and then that hopefully will help to legitimize my approach so yeah that makes sense let's do that if we handle it that way yeah. um so yeah po polyvagal theory has been around for it was first um tabled in i think 1994 so it's been around a while and it's an understanding it's, it's a theory around how our nervous system works and how our nervous system um essentially controls our day-to-day minute-to-minute experience of being human and there's been thousands of thousands of research papers showing that the learnings of polyvagal theory have been really helpful in multiple settings, many of them in initially in therapeutic settings in helping people uh, overcome trauma. And then recently, as neuroscience has become more precise and more developed, there have indeed been some, um, some queries and questions about polyvagal theory. Um, and a lot of that is around, well, you're saying that this pathway talked to that pathway, but I believe this neurotransmitter talked to that neurotransmitter. And my take on that as a coach who likes to speak kind of plainly and clearly to, to people is, OK, so when I, when I did my MSc, I learned some critical techniques. Um, so I'm, I'm initially cynical about anything that comes into my world. Um, the reason I think polyvagal theory helps is because it's really easy to understand and it explains our human experience. And although there are some scientific questions about it, as I say, they tend to be the ones that are kind of under the bonnet rather than ex rather than anyone questioning the framework that it results in. So if there's a bit of tweaking to be done in the finer details all, all well and good my sense is the framework still works at which point if you're happy for me to i'll go on to to the framework um please do yeah definitely. so the framework in my, in my, my approach pinball wizardry okay that, that comes from in proof that you can take the boy out of pr but you can't always take pr out of the boy in search of a kind of nice snappy way of summing it up um my experience of stress is this my experience is that i can be quite motivated i can be getting stuff done i'm getting things ticked off the list i'm being really purposeful and productive and then there'll be too much of something or a curveball will arrive and suddenly i'm a bit out of control somewhere and the way that i think about that is it's a bit like a game of pinball and to start with i'm the guy pressing the buttons racking up the points but at that pivot moment i suddenly become the ball and i'm hopelessly going from pillar to post and the wizardry is around spotting that pivot moment and employing some tactics and techniques and tools to help me come back into being the guy that's in control and it's not foolproof it's impossible to be foolproof because your nervous system gives you these different states which i'll talk about in a moment and it's human to to kind of carousel through them but what a bit of pinball wizardry can help to do is to accelerate your movement back to the state that you want to be in so that's that's the sort of snapshot of where pinball wizardry came from um, if I say a bit about the three different states, so polyvagal theory says that your nervous system, first and foremost, is there to protect you. It's like your best pal. But like all best friends, sometimes it will make the wrong call. And the nervous system's got three states it can essentially put you into. Um, I won't use the full scientific names, but I'll just sort of shorthand a little bit. There's a state where you're relaxed and you're in you're able to access all of your strengths and your skills and your social connection with others you at your best if you like 
there's a state that I've just described as pinball, where initially you're getting stuff done, but then it might just all become too much. You get a bit out of control. And then there's a third state, which is an immobilized state where you've just shut down. You've reached an exhausted collapse and you're going to be there um, until that mood passes or until you remember that actually there's some things I can do to help myself here. And because I've befriended my nervous system, I know what it needs to move myself forward. And I think that the, for me, one of the beauties of this approach is that there's so much talk about what's happening in our brains. There's so much focus on mindfulness, which I'm completely behind, by the way. But this approach is the bit before mindfulness. It's a bit about it's the bit where you look after what your body needs and what your body's doing, which then influences the brain and allows you to achieve that more mindful approach. OK, interesting. Well, thank you. Mm. And I, I do like the pinpool analogy as well. That's exactly as mm. build. It helps you understand it in, in relatable yeah. terms. Thank you. It, it, it does sound as well, I think, and particularly the three states you're just explaining there, that to me sounds a bit similar to the, the fight, flight and freeze responses. Well, in fact, the, the middle stage that I described there, um, my pinball, is the fight, flight, freeze. The, right. The neg the, when, I, when I flipped to be the ball of pinball, I'm going to fight, I'm going to run off, or I'm just going to freeze in those moments. Mm. And very often for me, not for everyone. And this is, this is kind of the beauty and the fascination that we've all got the same three states, but our experience of them is incredibly different. They're all unique. My experience is at the end of um, that being the ball of pinball, I'm very likely after that to get to a to collapse, immobilized stage. And I've almost got to the point of kind of accepting that's going to happen and thinking, okay, well, how do I then get out of that? that for me, that works better than trying to, to stem that downward collapse. But for others, it will be a different approach. And I, I would just say the invest when we use this approach, when I use it with my leadership clients, it's a personal investigation. And pinball came from my own investigation. And when I work with people, I encourage them to find their own shorthand. Because it's, re it's really interesting you mentioned there, fight or flight. That's almost a universal currency, I think. Most people have heard of that. But ask them to name the other states. And, oh, I'm not, not really sure about that. And I think it's like anything. Once you can start knowing where you might want to go, where you can name it, more chance of getting there. Very true. Yeah, I guess it's understanding is the first step, isn't it? When yeah. any problem. Yeah. Um, Kind of links to the thing you were saying about self awareness before. Indeed, self awareness of um, the patterns of your nervous system, not yes. even just the patterns of your brain, the patterns of what's happening for you as a human being, with all sorts of different systems and circuitry inside you as well. Interesting as well that you share your own personal experiences with stress. A few things I've noticed about it with people I've worked with and with myself as well is is one quite common thing is is almost this feeling of just overwhelm and just there's too many things happening at once going from that position to taking the first step to to recognizing and solving the problem must be the most difficult part of this because if you're already feeling overloaded then picking up another thing another problem to solve yeah. even if it is that problem of being overloaded it, it's just too much isn't it yeah it can be and it's really interesting what you say there about there just being too much and overload because for, from a nervous system perspective we go into fight or flight. Let's let's go with that at the moment. Pinball for me. We go into fight or flight when we sense danger, when the nerve, not the brain, when the nervous system senses danger. And obviously, this is a system that's as old as time, almost <laughs> millennia into the development of this system. Um, and so, when it was developed, it was to to keep us safe against tangible threats. And luckily, most of us don't face life threatening issues. Um, in our daily work, in our executive life. So what tends to trigger the nervous system instead is either too much of something, too much work, too little of something, too few leads, too little work for a solopreneur. That's arguably worse than, than too much. And then um, something around timing as well, things coming too soon or coming too late. And so our nervous system kind of dances around those, those two dynamics of vo volume and timing and makes these calls for us. And sometimes they're spot on 
and other times it's like no mate you've got that wrong and i'm going to help you by um, by tuning into you and maybe applying some certain techniques it's a bit like going because all of this happens way below consciousness um it's automatic it's on autopilot but you can learn to be a bit of a co-pilot can never take control but you can work with your nervous system to go okay you're saying this but actually we're fine those numbers on the powerpoint or my call on the agenda whatever it is in the, the big meeting i'll be fine through that there's no danger chance for me to shine um and you can change what's happening bodily so that you can write the occasion show up in the way that you you want to fair enough yeah and i think this leads us nicely into the next question as well which is how can having a, a better understanding of, the, of that nervous system and how it works help leaders to reduce that feeling of stress and be more effective in their role? Mm. Mm. There are a couple of things, if you'd like me to, a couple of, of actual of techniques that I can share. Um, because what, if, if the nerves, if the leader is more aware of their nervous system, if they become more empowered around moving away from a, a position where there's just too much stress, then they will make better decisions in that relaxed state. You're better able to access all of your strengths, better able to bring people with you. And that's such an important part of leadership, isn't it? It's very hard to bring people with you if you're either in a really mobilized stress state or, or in a collapse state. Um, and why that's so difficult is because the people you're with, their nervous system kind of reads your nervous system and they go, oh, they're saying they're OK and that we need to do this. But what I'm picking up, I'm actually picking up your stress and there's a disconnect and that can make it really hard to carry people forward. So there's a couple of, of, of techniques I can share with you. These are really well evidence based. Um, they sound really simple and that's the beauty of it because you can kind of carry them in your back pocket. You could apply this in a board meeting or a big project meeting. So the first one uh, is around breathing. And you know how someone will say, if you're, you're obviously a bit nervous, you might be on the verge of panic, people will go, oh, take a deep breath. That's half a good idea. It's a really good idea when you take a deep breath and let it out slowly. In fact, you don't even have to take a deep breath. There's a technique called plus two breathing. And all you have to do for plus two breathing is become aware of your breathing. Maybe you'd like to do this with me as we go along here, David. Just become aware of your breathing and count how long you're inhaling for. Count your in-breath. And in normal conversational circumstances, it's going to be one or two probably. Let's let's go, let's go with two. If that's okay. Imagine you're breathing in count of two yeah it seems quite natural what you then do so you're breathing through your nose you then breathe out through your mouth for a count of four so in through the nose for two out through the mouth for four and if you do that for a short period of time you'll find that quite calming and the reason for that is because the in-breath mobilizes the nervous system it starts releasing adrenaline and cortisol which are the, the hormones associated with stress that we need some of to get through the day and get our tasks done but we don't want too much of it so we the in breath mobilizes us to do things it's the out breath that calms us it's the out breath that regulates the system and enables us to stay in that relaxed state so even in, and I've done this in a board meeting um, with, with, with clients um, that someone else will be speaking and you'll just take a moment to go, OK, I'm just going to do a couple of moments here and start doing the plus two. You can do it anywhere on the way on the way to a project meeting, do it on the bus, on the tube. If you do it for maybe a minute or so, half a minute, you should start to feel a bit more relaxed. Um, I'm wondering what you're if you had any experience of that, David. I could see that you were, were giving that a little go there. So I've I've had experience of a very similar one called box breathing. Oh, very similar. Probably heard yeah. Of, yeah. Um yeah. and a couple of people have mentioned that to me, a couple of past guests, in fact, mm. including one Mr. Dave Hollenbach, who was formerly a, a battalion chief in a fire department mm -hmm. in the US. Yeah. So he obviously did there were some very stressful situations. That was one mm. of the techniques that he yeah told me that he relied on when yeah. he was facing a stressful really situation 
yeah, a stressful situation. And again, one where there's a lot going on all at once. And in his case as well, literally lives on the line. So yeah. hard to imagine more stressful environment yeah. than that. So I think that's quite quite interesting that he yeah. found it useful in that context. Yeah. It kind of it supports what you're saying as well, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, it, it does. It, it's just that awareness of breathing. And the thing that that really struck me about that was I never knew that that was how breathing worked. Mm. The, the in breath is for action. It kind of makes sense. You know, if you're going to sprint or run or exercise, you take a, an in breath thing and you go and do it. But it's the out breath that's about relaxation. Um, and I, I was working with a, with a client yesterday and, and we were talking through a moment that, that they were finding really stressful. And I asked her to sort of play back her sensations and what was happening. So, yeah, and I was breathing in and I took a breath. And I took another breath and another breath. And so we did some work about in those moments, releasing, releasing that breath. So it's really, it's really interesting that we're you know, obviously, you know, she and I had been on this earth quite a few decades. And yet in our own ways, neither of us had ever really twigged until I learned and then I shared that, oh, yeah, that out breath is, is actually the key to relaxation. So that one, I think the plus two, the box breathing is great as well. The plus two is something you can take anywhere, anywhere with you to any situation. And. I mean, if anyone's got a competitive spirit, it's not a competitive sport, but it is quite nice. And I, I do this sometimes. Go, OK, well, let's see how three and five works for me. Let's see how four and six. And you can get into quite a nice meditative state by doing that. Though, of course, with any of that uh, duty of care flag now around, please don't try this. If you've got any sort of respiratory issues, uh, don't do anything that causes you any discomfort or concern. Yes, absolutely important to have the caveat in there. Yeah. Um, um, I, so it's something I find particularly intriguing in, in this sort of field. Um, there's this idea, isn't there, I don't, you know, that you see it in TV and movies all the time about psychosomatic effects, which mm. is where the brain has an impact on the physiology. Yes. What I think we're talking about here really is the opposite, isn't it, which is far less talked about, I think. Yes, yeah, it's, it's um, physiology coming first and enabling the brain to get to a calmer state because essentially um the idea here is that if the nervous system is constantly sending data about how we are to the brain and then the brain interprets so what this is trying to do is change the data flow from body to brain so you're absolutely right switching those two uh, dynamics around there the, uh, the, the other area uh, or the um, little technique people can try, again, plays you know, the, the same with the breathing one, that, that if, if we're going to fight or flight, our breathing will change. So let's have a more relaxed style of breathing. When we go to fight or flight, or flight, our vision changes. And going back all those millennia, it's the days when a threat would emerge and our eyes quite rightly, all they can see is the source of danger. So nowadays, when we go into fight or flight mode, maybe in a meeting, we'll find ourselves, I've had this plenty of times, almost kind of tunnel vision, just looking at the guy who I think is going to bring me down in the board meeting, for example, whatever it might be. So a really nice way to overcome this is to consciously change our vision, to change our focus. So at the moment, happily I'm in a relaxed state talking to you, David, but I am, I'm very conscious of just seeing you. So my, my, my focus is, is just on the screen in front of me. It's almost as if I'm looking from the front of my eyes and the front of my eyes are making a grab for whatever's in front. If I consciously go to a place where I'm almost looking from the back of my eyeball and I'm softening my gaze on what's immediate in front of me, Suddenly, I can notice oh, there's a plant on the desk to my right. I'm still looking at you, but I can see I'm, a, I'm aware of the plant as well. There's an armchair to my left. There's a lamp. So my, I've engaged my peripheral vision. And peripheral vision is great because it's kind of, you know, ancient man surveying the landscape. There's no, there's no danger here. And again, that softening your gaze, looking from the back of your eyes and just not then consciously looking at anything, you're still looking in the same direction. But okay, right, there's a whole other world of stuff beyond, <laughs> lovely as it is to look at you, David, but beyond that screen, there's a whole world of stuff. 
And the widening of the perspective is a signal to the nervous system that you're okay. It keeps you in that more relaxed state. So the, there are two techniques that have been used uh, widely with people who've, who've embraced this approach. Um, if there's time to share one more, I talked about personalization. Um, I talked about each nervous system reacting differently. So I'm going to step out of the world of work for a moment to something that happened to me very recently. It's my own personal experience. Um, I sing in a choir. So standing up in front of people, I've been doing all my career. Um, and singing in a choir in the chorus has been absolutely fine. I've loved it. I've only been doing it four or five years. When we were coming up to our summer concert uh, a couple of months ago, I was asked to do a solo. And I thought, that's great. I must be doing really well. I've been given a solo, albeit one line. Just had to step forward for one line of solo. And it was all going fine until the dress rehearsal. And in the dress rehearsal, started feeling um, my heart going, started feeling that vision closing, almost a tunnel vision. And all I could see was the, the choir leader, who's actually a very good friend of mine, but it was as if she was sort of a merchant of doom. And I felt my chest constrict. And that isn't great when you're trying to sing. And I sang like a drain. And I was so embarrassed in front of the rest of the choir. And I went into that kind of shutdown state that I mentioned earlier, where although people would come say, it'll be fine, Chris, you'll be great. I was just shunning them I, because physiologically I didn't have the energy to, to get involved and accept their encouragement. So I basically had a bit of a sulk, but I was thinking that I didn't want to, but I had no choice. And I was thinking of pulling out. I really thought I can't do this. Um, I just, I'm just not up to it. And it's funny how when you've had an episode like that, you start telling yourself the worst. And eventually I realized what I was having was a nervous reaction, a nervous system reaction. I was going into fight or flight and I lent into that experience. And I realized for me, the first indication, my first reaction isn't the heart, it's not the eyes. My first reaction is a dry throat. Everything else follows that. That's my conditioning. So what I did was when we sang, when we came to the main concert, I didn't pull out. I went ahead with it. And there was about a five minute spell where we're on stage at the, the intros are being made. And then we step forward and I sing my solo line. When we got on stage, I popped a quick Haribo. Kept my mouth moist. Nobody knew. And I sang like a dream. Or I sang as well as I can possibly sing, which may not be the best. But for me, I pretty much hit every note. And more importantly, I really enjoyed it. I could see that the choir leader was there to support me, that the audience were there to support and enjoy. And it was a really positive experience. And that was nothing to do with what was happening in my brain, you know, all the strategies I know about confidence and all that. None of them worked. The thing that worked was a really simple awareness of don't let your throat go dry. And everything else followed from that. So that's what I'd encourage your listeners to do, is to really become aware of their own reactions and see what little dodges and hacks they can figure out to keep themselves in that best spot. That's a, a great example. And hopefully there were no flying confectionery. There was no, happily, there was no <laughs> flying confectionery. There was, please, a, there was a very subtle gulp just before we started singing. <laughs> Good, pleased to hear it. And and well done. I mean, it, I, I couldn't possibly do something like that, partly because I don't have a very good singing, singing voice. Um, so I'd never be in that position to start with. But I, so there's lots of stuff in there that I'd love to to get into a bit more. Mm. So I think what you're telling us about the the way vision works and then the cues you get from your mm. eyesight is really interesting. Yeah, and a couple of things that, that that kind of sparked in my brain were first of all about the tunnel vision. So I've had a few conversations over the years with quite a few pilots, a couple of fighter pilots, and tunnel vision is a is quite an interesting one for them. Perhaps in some respects more so than it was. 50 years ago and others very different so if you look back to say second world war you know a spitfire pilot or something like that tunnel vision to them was about exactly as you've described it it was fixating mm -hmm. on the target um losing all awareness of anything else and quite often being killed by someone else they hadn't seen as a result and so they were they were trained in very similar ways as you've described to make sure that you don't focus only on what's in front of you and that you're 
you're widening your perspective mm. so you don't get caught out like that. And then as the technology of aviation has moved on, tunnel vision has become another thing to do with G-force and physiological response because that's something else that happens as the blood rushes away from the brain, the, the, mm. eyes, the eyesight starts to close in. So that was quite an interesting one. Partly very irrelevant, just that it was interesting to me. <laughs> I think all this stuff's interesting. How our mm-hmm. it's like our how we take for granted or the, the reactions of our basic kit, breathe well, yeah. our eyes, yes, and the impact indeed. that has on how we how we show up in the world. Yeah, and and then the second thing to do with the eyesight was about the peripheral vision. And perhaps you can tell me if this is a, an urban myth or not. But something that we we were taught quite early when we were kids. I can't remember why. Forget the context. But anyway, it was, was the peripheral vision is a lot more sensitive to motion. I don't know if that's true. Is that true? And if so, why? I haven't heard that. I, you've okay. got me there, Dave. I, 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 I'm going to have to find out. Yeah, we're going to have to go and do some more research after the Absolutely. episode, listeners. Yeah. Apologies for that. Yeah. You are, you are, reminds me of something my brother-in-law shared, who's a, a professor, um, with seemingly dozens of universities and he the, there's something he did about you you can you can see something in the corner of your eye mm. only when it moves there's something there's something there's something about movement but but um, i'm clutching at straws now yeah <laughs> but maybe yeah. we'll just have to look that one up maybe, maybe i've got confused with one of the jurassic park films or something but yeah <laughs> <laughs> stay still and he can't see you maybe um, maybe yeah um yeah, and then I guess the the last thing that occurs to me as well around your experience with the choir there, and the first thing that that came to my mind when you started telling us that story was this natural assumption that there's safety in numbers, and so you're perfectly fine when you're part of a chorus, and then but then the second that you have to do it by yourself and you're the the lone person on the stage or, or whatever, then it becomes an issue. Yeah, and, and that's that's a really interesting way of looking at it because in, essentially. Yeah, we're we're social beings. We we want to be part of a tribe, and in that very moment, I wasn't part of a tribe. I was on my own, um, in literally in the spotlight. Yeah, and and it was a new experience of that isolation, um, which my nervous system was obviously rebelling against. Going, oh, what's happening here? We don't. We're not happy with this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, it, things like that, mate, where there's kind of this almost cliche understanding of it like safety in numbers everyone's heard that for, mm. for decades it does make me wonder how much of it is is down to like a physiolo- physiological or evolutionary mm. imperative and how much mm. of it is just no. a so- show social construct almost because we've been hearing it for so long Re- really interesting debate i mean the what what you've now made me think of is so that the center of polyvagal theory is something called the vagus nerve which wanders, it's called the vagus nerve because it, it's, it means the wanderer in Greek. And the vagus nerve wanders all the way from an intersection with our facial nerves all the way down the spine through the respiratory system into the, uh, into the torso, the main organs and so on. What you made me think of was the fact it runs right down, the, down your spine. And so that thought about, have you got my back? Has my leader got my back? The comfort of someone putting their hand on your back is a connection with the vagus nerve. So again, social construct or physiological um, determination there, perhaps, perhaps a, a bit of both. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how we prove it one way or the other, really. Um, that's a problem for science. That's a problem for science. <laughs> you know, for, for leaders, it's one of the most powerful questions they can ask is, do my team think I've got their back? I, are they safe within my within my team? And if they do feel that, their nervous system will react, will relax. They'll be able to to give more of their best. Absolutely, yeah. And of course, the best way to achieve that, leaders, is to actually have their back. There yes. we go. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Not, not a difficult question that one, I think. But um, yeah. anyway. <laughs> and uh, yeah, too, too often though, the answer is actually a mm, kinder. Well, yeah, that's it, isn't it? I think, yeah, it's 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 about a long term pattern of behaviour for me. I think you've got to. Yes. Uh, we could talk about all sorts of things there, like leading by example and yeah, being the remover of obstacles and all those other lovely things that great yeah. leaders do. Indeed. What is the biggest leadership lesson that you've learned in your career so far? There are so many places I could have gone with this. The one that that has. has 
come up for me now is for for leaders to share their misgivings early if you sit on something if you're not quite sure of something and sit and i think i will figure it out later it's much harder to figure out later that might apply say if you're interviewing somebody and you think oh well they're great on all these things but i'm not sure about this particular thing but we'll go ahead with it anyway once they're in the business it's much harder to address that and the longer you leave it it's the harder it is to address much better at the start so we're going to employ you I think you're absolutely great we'd like to work with you on this thing how about that so you just got it out there as early as possible if you let things fester it's going to get more difficult and it will also stop you being fully authentic to you know the name of the show leading with integrity it's much harder to do if you're holding something back so what i'm not saying and if someone's you know stepping up into their management career for the first time this isn't about um coming across as a bit chippy and having too many opinions too soon it's about showing curiosity maybe saying i'm could you just explain to me how this is working so i'm not quite understanding or i don't quite see yet so sharing your misgiving in a way that isn't judgmental but gets it out there and on the table the sooner that you can do that and very often if you are early in your career the more senior leaders value people who are prepared to broach potentially difficult things constructively so that that would be my uh, my the, my thought to share in terms of uh, a leadership lesson that i've learned i think that's a great answer which i've not had that often actually not not great answer but that specific answer <laughs> right. i had loads of great answers obviously i'm sure i know i've yeah. heard them <laughs> <laughs> um and i think it's also to me i think it's quite a good way for a new manager particularly if you're new to an organization as well to really get to grips with and understand the culture of that organization because the reaction you'll get to taking that approach to asking those kinds of questions mm -hmm. will tell you volumes about your senior leaders and what they value and what they don't and perhaps whether you want to remain in that organization yeah, maybe, maybe so yeah it is an interesting one though i think it, it is a good lesson i think I, I, that's the kind of lesson i would have liked to have learned as well a long time ago in my early career too because there's so many things on there where you just kind of swallow it you push it down you don't mention it because you don't want to be seen as yeah. the problem employee the difficult manager or the person who's always throwing obstacles up instead of trying to help or find a solution and, and mm. it becomes stigmatized almost doesn't it it does and, and i think when, once something is on the table i'm going to say unchallenged what am i better mm. the unquestioned mm. it's, it solidifies and becomes a given and yeah. givens are much harder to tackle than things that haven't yet solidified people say oh well let's maybe we'll come back i'm not 100 percent sure on that maybe we can come back to that next week or next time just raising a bit of a flag around it um and also signaling to the people around you that you're someone with with opinions someone with a curious mind um which is as long as it's done in, the, in a respectful way in a collaborative way you know nine times out of ten that sort of approach will, will serve you well yeah I, I think so as well and yeah you, you're absolutely right i think in the approach to take to it as well trying to do it in a genuinely curious way and not trying to ask sort of gotcha questions or just point out something for the sake of doing it i think it, there is an art to asking that question in the right way as well which i think is something that especially new leaders really need to, to focus on on learning how to do that in the in the right way yeah isn't it is an interesting one i think especially as well where there's perhaps some contentious decisions being made you know a lot of a lot of senior leaders that i've seen over the years if you don't raise that question early on if the then they take silence as agreement and, and you're right you know by by the time it, you then have the confidence to raise it much later it's too late yeah, yeah if, you, if you're maybe a project manager and you you believe in technology for example you think there might be a, a bug or a flaw in the system the sooner it's raised the better for everyone nobody wants to be wise after the event and your leaders you would hope have got the interest of the project in mind 
and you would hope they'd be able to tune in to say, oh, yeah, actually, that is, that's a bit annoying, actually, because it's going to cost us a week. But actually, if we don't nail it now, it's going to cost us however much to months later on down the line. Indeed, or at the very least, I mean, using the tech example again, if they weren't aware of it, you've brought it to their attention. They may decide right now is not the time to do anything about it, but at least they've made that informed decision. Yes, exactly. You've given them the opportunity to exercise their judgment. Exactly, and they would appreciate that, I think, if if they're any good at their job. (laughs) (laughs) Right, yeah. So the next question then, different tangent, but here we go. What do you think is the biggest mistake a leader can make? Well, this is one I've definitely made in my time as a, as a leader, and I see it still with, with leaders that I work with. Um, it's about judging people too soon. I'd like to say, if at all, never judge someone, but we all make judgments. But I think it's very easy for leaders to decide early on that somebody's great. They're absolutely amazing. I can rely on them. They're absolutely the golden child of this team and then be blind to any mistakes or shortcomings they might have. At the same time, it's very easy early on to go, what have we done? This person doesn't sit in my team. They can't do X, Y and Z. It's very easy to do that and conversely not to see what they can do not to see that actually maybe to go back a moment they don't feel that they've that you've got their back maybe you're not creating a conducive environment in which they can perform to their best you know i I remember um here very early on in an agency that I was was running was at board level in, um, we hired someone. Oh, they just have no, never going to fit. They'll never they'll never do anything um, in this particular industry. Um, they 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 left our business. Next role they got was some something incredibly senior at Twitter. So it's like, okay, what did we know? <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that as well. Definitely, I think there's. I think a second element I would add to that is, and it's not just necessarily about judgment, actually, it's perhaps wider than that, just to general decision making, but is is never revisiting it. Because, and and it reminds me, you know, we've all worked, I think, for some of those bosses who are very proudly make statements like, oh, I'm a brilliant judge of character. And, And invariably, what they mean when they say that is, I can take one look at you, make a judgment, and then I'm never going to change my mind. (laughs) <laughs> yes, um, and, and actually you know first of all in an interviewing context where you're looking to hire a new person um, there, there's a separate conversation to be had about that and how that works anyway um, which I've had before and people are probably sick of me complaining about it but how can you possibly make that kind of judgment about a person the first time you've met them you don't know really anything about them apart from a one-page cv because you've refused to read more than one page because nobody does it's just it's it's anti-human is what it is in my opinion <laughs> it's it's definitely high on my ever-growing list of pet peeves i think about mm. leadership because you, you're missing out on so much and there's the, the case as well where you where you've explained it about going too far the other way and, and assuming that they're going to be great and then never changing that position either even when they prove not to be up to the job and so there's a whole thing there i think about rushing to judgment but then also having rushed to judgment not changing your opinion your perspective when faced with new evidence yeah yeah and only uh, acknowledging the evidence that supports your view oh yes confirmation <laughs> bias that's confirmation. my favorite bias that yes. one. yeah, yeah. <laughs> which we're all guilty of we're all guilty absolutely of yeah absolutely <laughs> and it's i think it's one of the most difficult ones to address even when you're aware that you have it as well it's just so tied up, I think, in human nature and the way our current society works. Yeah, for um, sure. Tipping us back towards the positive side of leadership, mm. what has been your best experience personally of being led? Happily, I've had been I've benefited from lots of great leaders through, through my career. Um, one or two not so great, um, but you asked for the best experience. And I would name uh, a guy called James Maxwell, uh, who's sadly no longer... Uh, with us now he passed a few years ago he was the leader of a smallish independent pr company called scope communications management that he had set up Uh, it got to be about 30 people and then he sold it to a much bigger international organization and um he went on to be i think he was european ceo so he did one of those things that 
perhaps few leaders manage to do, which is to really make a mark in the the company that acquires your business, which takes a whole load of diplomatic and personal and commercial skills. But what I really loved about James was that he hired me when I was essentially a manager, pretty good manager. I think I got five years experience then. And he really showed me and helped me to become a leader. So he was the guy that gave me my, my first P&L, profit and loss account, my first business unit. And he was a real leader with values. You know, he, integrity was absolutely what he was about. There was passion. Um, there was commitment. There was creativity. And there was a real human touch as well. He'd always make a point about asking how how my family was at a time when I was having some personal difficulties he was right there in a sort of in a way that was wasn't overly sympathetic but acknowledged that I was doing well to cope with some stuff um and just to, to be supportive of me as an individual at the same time as inspiring me to greater heights as a practitioner as well um and that that example has stayed with me for the well, best part of two or three decades now so um, so, yeah, that's what I would point to that that person who helped me really move from manager to, albeit a new fledging leader. Well, that's a lovely story. I, I always enjoy hearing the, the good experiences people have with leaders because I think I hear too many bad ones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. And, and he had wonderful humour. There was a lot in her moments of high stress, high pressure. Which, to be fair, sometimes he might add to in his pursuit of, of perfection and client satisfaction. Mm. There was always humour around the next corner. Yeah, yeah, which I, I often find is the one of the real signs of a great leader is one who can do all of these amazing things and yet still have a bit of a sense of humour about it. Yes. I think a trap of leadership is is taking yourself far too seriously, isn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. And if that humour can come with a hint of self-deprecation, to your point, yeah. So, so much the better spot on absolutely difficult question for you now mm. at least i hope it'll be difficult some people breeze through this one and others really struggle with it if you could go back in time to the beginning of your career what advice would you give your younger self that's a great question um the answer that comes up for me would be to say to my younger self chris just get over yourself recognize that Although, you know, I did pretty well early on in my career. Um, I was on the board by 30 and all that sort of stuff. I thought I was the finished article. I thought I'd done all my development as an individual and a person just because I got quite a big badge. And so I found myself fighting the same battles year after year, the same chips on my shoulder. And what I wish I could say is, just recognize you're going to keep growing and developing and welcome that that would be what i'd say and i don't think i'd change too many outcomes but that advice might help change my experience and my stress levels as i went through some of those management and leadership challenges yeah i think that's a very good piece of advice and i think i would steal it as well if i had the same opportunity one thing i would say actually i, I obviously went through a bit of a journey the last few years and, and mm. i got a lot better at that but something that I think has continued to help me with that is starting a podcast and talking to people like yourself. Every time I have a conversation like this, I learn something new about leadership, which reminds me I don't know everything about leadership. And so that, I think, is a really great way of doing it, um, not just necessarily about leadership. If there's something where you think your, your, your education has maybe stagnated and you need to kind of open up the self-awareness on, on that and be more open to learning – Start yeah. yourself a podcast and start talking to other people about it. I, I thoroughly recommend that. Yeah. yeah. I think we might be kindred spirits there because you, you can never know everything about learning, about leadership, because uh, no. you can never know everything about people. But I love your point about growth there. I really, really do. I think I didn't have the language to express it when I left PR. Mm. And I have it now as a coach. So I think I'd stopped learning, and that was one of the problems. I'd, mm. I'd become too good in, in limited fields and just felt I need I needed something new. Yeah, it's yeah, something I've I struggled with as well. Right? It's um I don't know how common it is, but I feel like it probably is, but that might just be my my biases again because it's been my experience therefore everyone must have yes. but, yeah, Um yeah, it's it's a funny old one. Similar conversation about learning and personal development with with previous guests and something I've said in the past is 
when it comes to leadership, like the day you stop being open to learning in, in my book is the day you actually stop being a leader because there's a whole leading by example aspect, I think, to start with. But also, I really love this concept of lifelong learner. Mm. And I think any effective leader is a lifelong learner. They're, they're always open to learning something new about leadership, about their craft, about their skill set, about their industry, their job, their company, you know, whatever it is. Nobody should ever be able to say, I've learned everything I need to know. For sure. Wholeheartedly agree with that one, David. Yeah. And I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> I can't um, nice to see you on your soapbox. But... Well, yeah, it's this yeah. good camera angle. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> leadership heroes the conversation has been really enjoyable time has been flying and we're on to the last question Mm -hmm. so this is quite often the most difficult question really looking forward to hear your answer about it but no pressure so it's called leadership heroes and the question is if you had to pick one person and they could be alive or dead past or present real or fictitious if you feel a bit adventurous who, in your opinion, would perfectly embody leadership? Who would that person be and why? Um, well, I'm going to go with someone who's in, in the news today. Um, we're obviously talking the, the morning after uh, the England men's football team has qualified um, for the European, European Championship next summer. So I'm going with Gareth Southgate. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why. Um, one is you know, leadership is about delivering results and he's got to the stage where now england football fans take it for granted that we'll qualify for the major tournaments to the extent that you know a lot of fans have left wendy last night by the time the final whistle went there was no great sense of celebration it was just oh yeah we've qualified again go back to the time before southgate there was national angst about would we would we qualify for those tournaments so he delivered results um whether or not he goes on to actually win something, a tournament, you might say, well, that'll be, that'll show if he's a good leader. And I wouldn't agree with that. I would say he's got us to the place where we may well win something. And if there's a moment of brilliance that stops that happening, it doesn't undermine his, undermine his qualities as a leader. The qualities that I see in him are uh, definitely integrity. He's very calm. And actually, I was thinking when I saw him in his post-match interview, He's, there's, he's definitely aware of the importance of breathing. He's always very steady. He's always very measured. Um, and what he's done is galvanise and meld together highly skilled and very autonomous, independent people into a really effective team. And he's done it very quietly, very persuasively. It's clear what his values are. Um, so, yeah, he's the guy that uh, comes to mind for me today. Well, fair enough. Now, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. We have had that before. Oh, you know, yeah. I'm not a football fan by any means. Mm. I, I don't follow it. I know very little about it. However, he was last picked, I think it was 2020, maybe 21. It was the year that there was some big tournament and we lost at the last hurdle or something. Okay, yes. As I say, I don't follow football. Yeah. Um, and and someone else picked him, and then I went and read up about him as a result because I have vague memories from childhood of him as a footballer. Mm-hmm. You know, it was fashionable to like football as a kid, so we yeah. watched it. And I remember, I think he missed some penalty or something, and it was the worst thing ever. Yeah, at the time. I loved it. Um, and he was so that. yeah, and so to go from that quite public failure early in his career to to become a leader, I think of his stature now mm. is quite impressive on its own. Yeah. But also, I think it explains some of the nature of his character and his approach to leadership that we saw in that previous incident a few years back, uh, by which I mean his his humility and the way that he handled failure. Yeah. And I think that actually, to me, is a much stronger test of a leader than than when everything goes well. Yeah, I think um, so. And, and I think when things do go well, he maintains a balance and a dignity. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's really nice to see. Yeah, there's that. You've almost got to be a gracious winner, but but not a bad loser, if that makes sense. At the yes. same time, and mm-hmm. yeah, he's um, yeah, I, I've got a fair bit of respect for him. I have to say, which which says a lot. Anyone who knows me, if, to hear me say nice things about anyone involved in football, would be quite a 
turn up for the books so yeah. there you go <laughs> indeed sounds like my my answer just sneaks sneaks under the wire yes it? yes yeah. you got away with it I'll let you with that one. One. <laughs> <laughs> well good pick and good explanation behind it as well thank you and we're almost at the end of the episode we're nearly out of time so my last question for you really is if any of the listeners have enjoyed hearing from you and would like to hear more about what you do learn more get in touch with you perhaps would you like to point them towards your website i'd love to point them uh, if they'd like to get in touch they'll find me on linkedin or they can find me with my very easy uh, to remember website which is chriswoodleadership.com uh, and they can get in touch with me from there and it'd be lovely to hear from them uh, if anything i've said today has resonated uh, or they'd like to get in touch and uh, share some more similar conversations we'd love to hear from them Perfect. And they won't even have to remember it as easy as it may be because I'll put the link in the episode description. So there we go. Job well done then. (laughs) Excellent. Well, Chris, thank you again so much for your time. I've really enjoyed chatting with you today and I've certainly learned a lot about this new science as well. So thank you. Thank you, David. Lovely spending some time with you. Likewise. Your journey to better leadership doesn't need to end with just managing stress or anything else that we've spoken about in today's episode. You can dive into an ocean of resources and solutions at www.leadernotaboss.com. And remember, you're just a click away from scheduling a complimentary, commitment-free conversation with me about leadership. Thank you once more to Chris for being a brilliant guest today. Very grateful for that enlightening discussion we've been able to have today. Listeners, your time and engagement are also very much appreciated. Keep those reviews and comments coming. They are genuinely inspirational to us. Next week, we'll be doing something a little bit different, a bit special, because it's going to be the last week of the podcast this year, and it's also a particularly festive week as well. So to draw this year and this season of the podcast to a close, we're going to be doing some bonus episodes and some extra episodes. So starting on Wednesday next week, the 20th, we'll have the next episode in our series about leading tech teams and things the AI can't do for you or won't do looking at you chat gpt and that will be with matt warden and he'll be telling us all about his journey from developer from software programmer right the way up to ceo and all of the various lessons he's learned about leadership and more along the way on thursday the 21st with episode 84 a chat with change and transformation expert kerry l bass Change is a constant with life, but especially so with technology, and leaders often find themselves in a cycle of constant change management when it comes to leading their teams effectively in that context. So Kerry will be sharing the benefit of his extensive experience in change and transformation and what can make it successful versus not so much. So that'll be an excellent episode for all you tech leaders out there. And then on Friday, the 22nd, to conclude the mini series on technology leadership, we will be talking with Sonia Kuto about her experiences leading technology teams and organizations in the tech sector. And then to finish off the year, I have two extra episodes for you, and they'll be coming out at a weekend. So on Saturday, the 23rd, we will have an extra episode to help us prepare for our New Year's resolutions. And I'll be talking with Annie Margarita Yang about her book, The Five Day Job Search, about her financial advice YouTube channel, and about all sorts of topics around those two themes. On Sunday the 24th, Christmas Eve would not be complete without a Christmas special. So that's what we're doing, a Christmas special of Leading with Integrity. We're going to have a whole host of guests joining us for that one episode. It's going to be a bit different. It's going to be a bit of fun. It's going to be very festive. And I'm not really going to spoil it for you. You're just going to have to wait and see. Just like those presents that may or may not be sitting under your tree. Unfortunately, you can't shake this one, though. Bad luck. So it's going to be a busy week for me next week. I hope you'll be able to join us for some or all of those episodes and help us finish off the year 2023 in grand fashion. That's all from me today. Thank you so much for listening and I will be back next week. Until then, stay safe, have a great December and be a leader, not a boss.